Uh, so it's in the Dropbox. It should pop up at any moment. Like a possessed nice. doll in an Aaron Rudell story. Are you already recording? Yeah. Thanks for listening to the Dune Steep Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Everybody and welcome to the Doom Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I am your host, Big Anklevich, and here by my side is my co-host, Mister. That would be Rish Outfield, sir. Yeah. Did you forget? No, I was letting you introduce yourself. Oh, how embarrassing! And you did a great job of it. Thanks a lot. Was that sarcasm? I, with us actually being in the same room, I, I, I can't tell. <laughs> I look on your face. Oh, are you just... Dead look on my face from the Botox is <laughs> not giving it away. So um, is, is this our final episode? No, the final episode we recorded six years ago. <laughs> True. <laughs> and it's been waiting. It's where we talked about what our favorite shows were. And there were four up yeah, to Yeah, and point. there was so very few of them that we did do that once, uh, folks, ladies and gentle, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Um, we recorded a final episode so that we wouldn't just pod fade which we did anyway <laughs> not, not quite we're still limping along <laughs> but someday when we do decide to pod fade we're going to uh do you decide to pod fade i think that just kind of happens doesn't it i think in our case we will decide okay like then we'll throw there that. have been so many times when i was just like okay here i'm writing the email to him <laughs> air the f-ing final episode uh, i may even actually have typed that email before and didn't end up sending it uh-huh. but yeah it's standing by it's going to be really out of date and weird yes yeah, so one of us had just gone through puberty when we recorded it it's... yeah we talked about our favorite episodes and yeah i think we had less than 50 at the time it was but we still have it i remember we considered making it a uh, like a incentive, incentive. like if you want to donate to the show we'll send you the final episode I guess it could be neat. I don't know. People could still donate to the show. It, yeah. They don't they don't get anything for it other than that the show continues. That's kind of why you donate in the first place, right? Is the show going to continue? It's just up in the air right now, man. No, it's not up in the air, man. I swear to you it will continue. According to on my side of the fence, there is two people involved in it, I guess. So there's always that. But uh, I mean for it to continue. Okay. There are three people that are like pleased by that, and the rest is, man, nah, they stopped listening already. <laughs> it's like, I stopped listening long ago. It's like the banter. The banter is why I stopped listening to the Dune Steve. <laughs> but we do have a story today, right? Oh, it's not, it's not just a banter episode? It's practically an all banter episode, kids. Sorry. Yeah, at this point, we have a story. It's not a long story, it's a flash fiction. Is that, a, is that a word I can use? Is, I think it would have to be a little longer to uh, be flash fiction. Court composer, can I say flash fiction? I'm sorry there isn't time. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, by our old pal J.M. Perkins, who I think we first brought him onto the show with a story about an organization called Chemo. Oh, do you remember the Chemo anthem, the song that they sang? Oh, fist yeah. and hand and ripe yeah. young buttock, we will <laughs> march into Lubbock. Nantucket. I, wait, wait, sorry, oh, Lubbock, I said Lubbock, Lubbock, but you Lubbock Texas. Nantucket. That's good. That's better. <laughs> How far away from the, Lubbock are you going to be living? The town of Golden Woods. Yes, that that you're the, moving to the town of Golden that Woods, was the Texas. Story that it uh, it came with. How close will I be to Lubbock? I haven't the foggiest. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't realize that Lubbock rhymed with buttocks. Why? It, Wait, doesn't, it doesn't. It doesn't really. They both end with k, with a CK. But Louis it's, CK. It's not one of those perfect rhymes. It's one of those where you just kind of, you know, when you don't really have a perfect one, you go with it. When you can't say house and mouse, you know, you go buttock and Lubbock. Anyway. <laughs> yes, our old pal J.M. Perkins, who first graced our airwaves back with the town of Golden Showers. I mean, Woods. He's back again. This is a second... The town of Morning Wood. <laughs> it's wrong either way. 
<laughs> this is another superhero story. The last time we had him on was, I want to say, the... He did the cleanup crew one? No, no, that was he Josh did Roseman. The... Wait, it uh, was the, the famous trombonist? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, well, uh, announcer man cut... Wait, is announcer man not here today? What the hell no, happened? He's here. He's... I um, think he's hiding back there. The one with we, Kung we... Pao Shrimp? Is that... Yes! The Kung Pao Shrimp and the Gimp. The Gimp when he was in a Gimp costume. Yeah, I can't... Ah, uh, we should have ran that story instead of passing on it. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, we go that's... back in time and actually air that? <laughs> that's what he was last uh, with us with, a superhero story then. And now we're back again with another superhero story. This one is called... Dr. Genocide and the Four and a Half Stages of Grief. Wow, that's a good title. I like it. Is it did, did, did I get it right? I don't know. Was it four and a half or <laughs> you five? You don't know. That's why I left it up in the air for you. I thought you were just letting me I knew choke. it was a little more complicated than just like, I'd like it a lot better if it was just the hunted. Um, so... One day before we air that final episode, <laughs> we should tell that story yet again. Yeah. Uh, it is actually called Dr. Genocide and the Five Stages of Grief, but I made the joke four and a half... And he, he liked that. Not enough to change the name of the story. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> All right. So it's Dr. Genocide and the five stages of grief. Yeah. Do we have a, 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 a about the author for him? We used to do that. and I. Well, we just talked a lot about him. He's been on the show a lot. I will put links to his other appearances on our show. As well as a link to his website. And the um, naked baby photos, too. Okay. And if my books were still on the shelf, if this <laughs> wasn't the room that my wife decided to pack up first, because she's so embarrassed of it, I would have the chemo, How I Learned to Kill book on my shelf still, instead of it being in the box that announcer man is hiding behind. Screw you guys. So that is available as well, I believe. Uh, so we'll have a bunch of links in the show notes for Mr. J. M. Perkins. And we'll call that our About the Author, because I think we've talked enough about him, and we can just lead into the story. Okay. So yeah, we'll head straight into the story, and we'll see you in, oh, what, like a minute and a half or something? I don't know. Yeah, with By tooth and nail, by crook and by rook. By brook and by crook, by hook Crook and by crook. And by crook. I don't think that goes with the Good story, night. so you can just skip that and we'll go on to Dr. Genocide. Dr. Genocide and the Five Stages of Grief by J.M. Welcome to your doom, Captain Justice, I say, pulling my skull cap lever. The insufferable ah! fool falls through the trapdoor chute into the doom maze. I turn to my wall of monitors. I watch the screens, following his progress. I even allow myself to enjoy a little maniacal laughter. <laughs> but only a little. Maniacal laughter tends to get me punched in the face. Captain Justice tumbles onto his feet. He dodges the spinning death blades, flips over the automated turrets, and lands in my pit of trans-dimensional lava frogs. His skills are as impressive as ever, which isn't surprising, given that he's been doing this longer than anyone. There's been talk that he's past his prime, long since past retirement. But no, he's the same worthy opponent he's ever been. I have often mused on how great a team we could have been. No matter. It just means he has to die. It just means I have to kill him. Not that I haven't tried, mind you. There was the army of evil clones I'd derived from the knuckle-skin fragment I scraped from the shattered remnants of my teeth. The brain-wiped love interest with the shadow warrior implants. The crack squad of battle mimes. The list goes on and on. All just dust and wreckage now, I'm afraid. All failures. But I have learned from all my missteps. 
just as I learned from the endless simulations I have run with the computer model for Captain Justice's psyche. Note to self. The computer model seems to have recently grown meta-sentient and seized the backup and security systems of level 28 through 29. I really have to do something about that sometime soon. Wait. What? CJ is down? Rewind camera, I say. Play. Okay, so he dispatches the frogs. <laughs> He's ducking behind the brood queen's body to dodge an energy blast. He encounters the manhandler robots. Okay, okay. He goes up for a finishing move against the alpha bot and... And his head snaps forward. Blood splashes out as the bullet from one of my neural net snipers passes through him. Current view. CJ is just lying there. Still... Sure, it's some kind of trick. I'm going to have to sit and wait and watch. Two weeks have passed. Captain Justice hasn't moved. He has begun to emit methane, my sniffer drones inform me. This can't be right. It's wrong, somehow. Maybe it's been a double this whole time. An up-jumped sidekick or... Something ridiculous like that. I'm sure I will be fighting Captain Justice, the fool, again. <sighs> Sigh. I flip through the channels to find some Cosby Show reruns. Toss my burger wrapper onto the heap that is accumulating by my feet. Suddenly, someone is using meaty fists to bang on the reinforced door of my lair. And I jump up. Smooth the wrinkles from my armor weave speed suit, hoping. Could it be? No. It's just some stupid cape who is not Captain Justice, yelling about vengeance or justice or something. Blah, blah, blah. I've heard it before. So, what else can I do? I release the Giga Beast. Screams waft through the windows. Derive no joy from them. My henchmen are growing insolent. Can't say I blame them. I just don't seem to have the energy to kneecap any of them with the necessary zest anymore. I shouldn't feel this way. My research is progressing nicely, and my control over Europa is nearly complete. But somehow, it all feels hollow. I know what has been bothering me. I never properly celebrated my victory. But didn't I remedy that yesterday? In retrospect, the party didn't go quite as well as I planned. I ended up disemboweling my second-in-command, screaming at my underlings who had assembled. They all just stared at me like I was crazy. Well, they always look at me like I'm crazy. I guess they looked at me like I was crazier, crazy in a new way. That was yesterday. Today I destroyed my breeding pits, nuked a city of mole men because their tribute was minutes late. Except it wasn't really late. I just wanted to destroy something. I thought I could get CJ to finally come out of hiding, but it hasn't worked. I tried to hold the world for ransom. Classic, right? The deadline came and they paid. After I spent the money equipping a berserker army, I was convinced someone would be there to foil my plot to enslave the tiny idyllic nation of Sao Po. No luck. It got so bad I had to smash my own doomsday machine to stop it from blowing up the sun. Captain Justice is gone. CJ is gone. I have to accept it. There is nothing I can do about it. I know what I have to do. 
I broke through the glass that encases the corpse of Captain Justice, collected all the samples I'll need. Then, I had to fight through the constantly evolving techno-organic hive the evil digital copy of CJ's mind, built out of levels 20 through 29, finally reaching the central processing core and ripping it from the mainframe. Today, I began the ongoing labor of pruning back the tumorous computer brain until all that's left is stock Captain Justice. He always had the most beautiful cascades of neural impulses. I'll go from there. Welcome to your doom, Captain Justice, I say as I pull my skull-topped lever. Captain Justice Mark Alpha falls through the trapdoor chute. I titter, happy as I haven't been for months. I have more energy now. Hell, my complexion has improved. I figure I'll start testing Alpha on the doom maze that finally bested his progenitor. I've enhanced this version, rearranged the superego a bit, doubled the muscle mass, streamlined the endocrine system, <laughs> All pretty standard, really. I don't know if CJ Mark Alpha will be a worthy opponent, but I've got another hundred clone templates growing in scattered labs across the globe, all waiting to be modified after this inaugural outing. After everything I've learned, I'm frankly amazed the original Captain Justice survived as long as he did. So frail. I laugh turning on the speakers so CJ can hear me. <laughs> All right, do we have an author's note? Should we read it? Okay, let me do it. Author's note. Do you want to read this, the author's note or should I? You read it, you got it in front of you, right? I loved writing this story, and was excited to hear it would be appearing on the Steve. I wish I had more clever things to say, but writing superhero stories is my resting state. The thing I could keep doing forever. The thing that's easy for me. See, I'm becoming Dr. Genocide here. <laughs> the thing that's easy for me to do, even when it feels like all my creativity has been wrung out. That was it. That was the yeah, there's no... All right, so uh, Dr. Genocide and the Five Stages of Grief was performed by Mr. Rochelle Field and no one else. I, I, well, no one was invited. I asked you if we should do it. It's, it was just one person part and it was very short. But yeah, it was a good story. I really enjoyed it. It's one of those things that I always think is kind of funny. What if this stuff actually worked kind of a thing? You know, the guy has the death trap. That the superhero is supposed to get through. And it works. Oh my gosh. Well, what would happen if that happened, you know? It's like I wrote a stupid story. Much worse than this one called The Shortest Ghost Story Ever Told. Where this woman buys a house. She goes into the house. And starts like moving in. She goes downstairs. And a ghost appears and says, Get out. out. And so she does. She gets out and she never goes back into the house. The end. That was the end of the story. You know, it's just one of those kind of things that you think is kind of funny where uh, what if the villain succeeded in killing the hero? Then what? You know, you always hear that with Batman and the Joker where, you know, the Joker is always like, oh, you made me and we need each other to stay sane. We're, you know, two sides. We're the yin and the yang, et cetera, et cetera. So what would happen if the Joker actually succeeded and actually killed Batman one time? What would happen to the Joker? Would he just lose it? Would he go crazy without a nemesis? He's already crazy, though. What if he went sane? <laughs> what if he's just like, well, I guess yeah. I'll start investing this money in, in an IRA or something? I, 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 I always meant to get my doctorate. Yeah. And, you know, I, I never could do it because I, I had these plans for killing people and <laughs> now that that's done i why did i never go back i mean gotham university it's just it's right there across town I, tuition would be no no big deal with all this money i stole from the uh, gangsters bank 
I'll marry Harley. We'll have a couple of pale children. It, I don't know. It never occurred to me to try this before. Yeah, it's it's just funny. I, I, I like this because of that. Do you know what the five stages of grief are? I was going to ask you. I know denial is one of them. Acceptance, of course, is the last. Anger. Yeah. Do, do you know what they are? It would tell me if I'm wrong. I don't. I mean, I know that all of those are okay. ones of them. Bargaining. I, yeah, I think that is also one and of them. And then I'm missing would... one, and it is probably like despair or something, you know, just to you hold on, w- hold on in one it. second. Don't, please don't fart. I'll give you a quarter not to fart. Well, I don't have a quarter. I'll give you a wooden nickel. I'll give you a copy of Chemo, How I Learned to Kill. Okay, sold. I won't fart, and I want that copy. Five stages of grief are denial, Bing. anger, Bing. Oh. bargaining. I don't know about it. Did we? Did I say anger? Yes. Oh, denial, anger, bargaining, depression. Depression. That's the one. And that... acceptance. And depression is the one you were missing. <laughs> Ironic, isn't it? So if we re-listened to that story with that list in front of us, it would he tick each one of the boxes as it goes along? I don't know. I'm trying to think. There was, yeah, I think there. Uh, most of the denial were there. was certainly there. The acceptance doesn't really feel. He didn't. I don't know. Maybe that's why the four and a half steps works better because I don't think he really accepted it. When you just make a clone of the guy and do it all over again, I don't think he really uh, accepted the. I mean, he did finally accept. Okay, this Captain Justice is dead, but I'm gonna I'm gonna make another one. And we'll just try this again. I don't know if that counts as acceptance. It seems more like bargaining. You do... I mean, it's obviously for superhero stories to continue. The hero has to defeat the villain. But every once in a while, you will get a story where the villain wins. And I'm, I, I think I remember Christopher Nolan saying that had Heath Ledger not passed away, that... In Dark Knight Rises, they would have just had a scene where the Joker just didn't know what to do with himself. And he just like turned himself in and went to, you know, the cell or whatever and just sat there glumly. Because Batman, if you recall, Batman yeah, retires. Everyone, you know, you, you get these stories where the villain wins. And then, you know, it's just like, well, now I have my throne and I'm Lord of all I survey and... What do I do now? I guess I could go to Gotham University. <laughs> hey. I hear they need a quarterback for their baseball team. Wait, what? <laughs> that sounds like something I would say. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the, the reason these bad guys get up in the morning is just like, you know, now, now I've come up with a plan that's sure to win, that is sure to succeed. Um, and they're constantly defeated and they keep trying and. Something we we would watch all these 80s cartoons where, you know, Skeletor had his plan or Megatron tried this and they were always defeated at the very last moment, sometimes by the ineptitude of the Decepticons or Skeletor's henchmen or just, you know, He-Man happens to turn left and where he was supposed to turn right and the rocket would have hit him had he turned right. And it's like, oh, darn, you know, I'll get you next time, He-Man. And it's like, well, why didn't Cobra just try that again? <laughs> but this time, keep the henchmen out of the way or fire two rockets this time. Or, you know, what I mean, and obviously that doesn't make for good storytelling. Where it's just like, we're going to try another Let's try mass that device. Again. This time we're going to make one that can't blow up into five pieces. <laughs> I think there's actually only three pieces, but anyways. You know, it's one of those things, you know, you get comedians that'll get up there and be like, why did the people in the horror movie, when they found a head in the toilet, not run for it? I want to say that was, wasn't that uh, Eddie Eddie Murphy? Murphy? Where he's just like, I would be out the door before the lid even hit the seat. It's funny for a comedy movie, but it doesn't make for a good story generally, you know. It's just like, okay, like the shortest ghost story ever told was short. It, it It was not something that anybody would want to listen to twice either it was just like oh yeah here's a one note joke and the end hmm. so you know like you said it doesn't make for good storytelling for skeletor to do the exact same plan the next day but just with a slight change so that this time it'll work 
But in real life, that's probably what would happen. They would just try again and fix the errors in their plan. I guess if Beast Man was blown up by the rocket or something like that, now well now they they need a new henchman, and this guy's not trained, so they're gonna have to get Triclops and then and, you know train him. So it'll take a while. Or Whiplash, you know that guy. You don't just train one of those guys in a day. When I went to say Triclops, I almost said Reese. <laughs> hey, I like Reese. Because <laughs> he has three eyes. He does. And as did Triclops. <laughs> exactly. Biclops. Dear Lord, he's got two eyes. <laughs> I don't know. The, the supervillains are often really interesting. The ones where they started out as friends or where it's like the evil opposite of the good guy. You know? The reverse Flash. Well, yeah, I mean, I, th- <laughs> I don't okay, know. So did, did you? Is that guy's not cool. Did you make fun of the name Reverse Flash? That was this villain in the first season of that cartoon, right? Cartoon. So <laughs> that show, Reverse Flash. Well, it's um, just kind of lame. I'm not a big fan of. Uh, I mean, we made fun of most of the DC villains because they're like you know the Bug-eyed Bandit and and stuff like that. They're just seriously okay. I guess this guy was invented in the '40s. Because, yeah, a lot of them are, are really kind of childish and silly. And, yeah, Reverse Flash is just one of those things. Like, seriously, there's a guy that he, he runs fast and he's the enemy of Flash and he wears an exact opposite of his suit. It's just yellow with red instead of red with yellow. I'm not a big fan of DC stuff because of some of that silliness. But he works on that show, right? Yeah, it's okay. They made him, uh, they made him work. Well, like the Flash villain, Professor Zoom, who shows up and they called him Zoom in the yeah, second season. Zoom. I would say that's a lamer name than Reverse Flash. Okay. And yet he was scary, dude. He was really effective, that second season villain. Sure. They had like the, the Flash face all melted and yeah. stuff. Just... But yeah, he wasn't scary because his name was Zoom. No. He no, was wasn't. scary despite the fact that his name was Zoom. I don't know, I think you just have to go with it on some of these things. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. just the conceit of, you know, this is a superhero world and if you try and apply too much logic to it, it becomes less fun, less compelling and, and just you know, it's like that line in the second Avengers where he's like, you know, fighting all of these killer robots and I have a bow and arrow. Uh-huh. That's definitely uh, the case with superhero stories. There's a reason why people expect you to eventually grow out of comic book stories, I guess. You know, oh, now I'm old enough that I should read real books or whatever. I don't know what it is. Not funny books. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> but uh, these days people don't do it. You know, we just, we just keep enjoying those crazy stories. It's what rules the box office these days. Nobody buys comic books anymore, but they love comic book movies. And I suppose part of it is because of that. I wonder if there will come a day with that we, you know, like the westerns, the comic book movies fade back away, and you only get a good one every now and then. That's the funny thing about westerns. I was talking about that with my with my friends at work, and you know, we were mentioning westerns, and just like you know, what is weird is when a western comes out these days, it's always good. <laughs> they don't. Put out the schlocky, crappy ones like they used to, you know, when they made a, like a new Western every week. Now that they're not just the story that people want to see every week, the only time a Western makes it through is the really good ones. Very seldom that you'll get a, a Western movie where you go, like, oh, well, I could skip that one. That one was terrible. I guess The uh, Magnificent Seven was one of those. I sure thought so. <laughs> I thought it absolutely blew Monkey Dong. But it used to be that a superhero movie would come out like... We, you get one this year and then maybe two years from now they'll make another one it's like oh and then they'll make kind of a comedy superhero movie it sort of counts but now it's just every how often would you say every other month there's one or at least if you're counting in the summer you get at least one a month i mean we just had logan then we had guardians of the galaxy i i would uh, submit that power rangers movie was a superhero okay movie. and there there was uh Wonder Woman. Lego and, Batman was probably. Oh, there you movie. go. Yeah, we're just bombarded by them. It's it's everywhere. It's a, it's the resting state. Do you so. have a resting state? 
he said superhero stories are his resting state. That is, I'm assuming that means the thing that he does the most or the easiest for him to do. The, uh-huh. the thing that he maybe he prefers to write the most, it's the least challenging to him. I will stop and let you answer the question. Um, my resting state, it appears to be writing paranormal romances. <laughs> Not that I mean to do that, but it's just what, it's what keeps coming out. But do you enjoy write, uh, reading paranormal romances? Or it's just what you think about a lot? I don't think about them a lot. Uh, I don't read them a lot. But for some reason, the ideas that I keep having have something to do with that. I think I may be past that phase, though. I don't know. I mean, I still have one that I'm still working on. 94, what was it? 94,800 some odd words into it. Can you believe that, guys? <laughs> and I'm probably 75,000 words from being done. Holy crow, man. Holy Professor Genocide. Yeah. Doctor Genocide? Doctor Genocide. Captain Justice. TJ. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know what my resting state would be. It's weird because fantasy ideas keep coming to me. Which, I mean, I've read my share of fantasies, but I would say my number one love and first love was science fiction. So why do I keep coming up with fantasy ideas? I don't know. It's not really what I planned, but it's just what I get. And I guess when it comes down to it, you can't dictate the ideas that you get. They just come to you. And then it's like, okay, well, that's a good one. I guess I'll go with it. I mean, we talked the other day. There was a Bad Gets My Goat, which, first of all, A, if you're not listening to Bad Gets My Goat, shame, shame on you. (laughs) And B, the street sweeper decided to come and just really F with us that day. I was trying to tell you of an idea that I had for a story. And, and I, it was I, you were grabbing, grabbing me. I, not the grabbing, idea fondling. was grabbing you. The, yes, you were not I actually was, grabbing yeah, me. Yeah, I was so actually standing, you're just not even within arm's reach. <laughs> the, yes, the idea was just captivating me. How's that? There's yeah, okay. no offensive way to take that, is there? <laughs> Tying was, me up and it was. I think I told you two different ideas that day. And now I'm trying to remember which two they were. Uh, I can remember one of them, and it was a fantasy idea. The other one was like, I don't know what you'd call it, magical realism. I guess kind of just a thriller. It wasn't even specifically sci-fi or anything. It was the memory plague story. Ah, okay. Yeah, the one I was thinking about is the the gods. Right, yeah, that was the fantasy had... story, obviously. Because gods are not real. Anyway, but yeah, you know, I, two ideas. I guess only one of them was fantasy, so that's... A plus. I've got an idea that I mean to write next after the book that I'm working on, if I ever finish it. Which is, I guess, also a fantasy story. It started out as a superhero story. uh, And oddly enough, it transformed into a fairy story about the police. And so you shall. Bing! The police are involved and fairies are involved. So I guess it really counts as that. I wonder, I can't remember who it was. I want to say his name was Trevor or something like that. (laughs) The the banker where they're like, what would you like to see more of on television? I'd like to see more fairy stories about the police. Um, (laughs) His wish is finally coming true. But didn't the the other guy wish that Raquel Welch would fall on him? No, I think that was the little kid. What would you like, Eric? I'd like to have... I'd like to have Raquel Welsh dropped on top of me. Um, the Gauntlet is what started out as a superhero story. And I, th- I guess I was trying to come up with a way to make it less like all the other superhero stories. Because of that, it merged into a fantasy story with King Arthur and fairies and all that kind of stuff involved in it and um hopefully it turns out good we may never know the world may never know because i'll be long dead before it's ever finished being written gosh i hope so <laughs> i don't know why i got off onto that tangent i, I oh, guess i oh, had asked you what your resting state. state weirdly i guess i write fantasy which i didn't expect to be my thing but 
most of my stories would probably be categorized as fantasy. Sometimes there's sci-fi elements. More often there's horror elements. But um, yeah, most of it would be categorized broadly as fantasy and then, you know, you move into it. There's all sorts of different kinds of fantasy like sword and sorcery fantasy and magical realism and other things. Fairy stories about the police. Fairy stories about the police. Yeah, that's a pretty broad category as well. A lot of titles that fall into that. I believe JM has a whole book about fairy stories about the police. Probably. Tinkerbell Vice. <laughs> Tinkerbell and Hutch. Oh, hey, that's not so bad. <laughs> Anyway. Yeah, you can say that again. I think we may have come to the end. What's your resting state, sir? Magical realism stories about an object that does something and people have to deal with it one way or another. Well, that's possibly the answer. I would have said uh, stories about shapeshifters, creatures that appear to be children, pe- creatures that appear to be an old woman, creatures that appear to be your best friend, but they're not those things. I would say the horror stories are my... Resting state, and then yes, but more specifically, shapeshifter horror story. Horror, yeah. Shapeshifter horror stories. I don't. I don't remember reading a lot of horrors in any of your stories, so I don't know that that's true. Well, they're the stories I publish under uh-huh. a pseudonym. Ah, uh-huh. I see. The ones that really bring in the money. <laughs> I, I really ought to try that. I, I've been saying that for years, but then you've been saying you're going to write the gauntlet for years. So yeah, we're, that's true. We're kind of even there. <laughs> Yeah, I, th- I think that's what I'd write. Um, but yes, you, you brought up an interesting point that I have written a lot of stories about ordinary objects that do something extraordinary. I also like writing the stories about a town where something is not right, like a, they have a weird tradition or they have a the laws of time and space don't quite apply to this town. Or, you know, you go to this town and it's like, oh, uh, we're kind of unique in that I, I tend to write those over and over again. I just, I like that. Because you were really into Brigadoon when you were a child? <laughs> My fiancé went to Brigadoon, and it's been 20 years now, still hasn't come, come you back. Haven't heard I, from her since. I'm sure she's just been delayed. <clears throat> All right. Well, now we know the resting states of both of your hosts and your author. And I think that's probably why you tuned in today. So uh, it looks like we've come to the end of our show i think and now a word from our sponsor hi there this is big anklevich host of the parsec award-winning doomsteep audio fiction magazine and when i think about the best music of all time i think about 80s music and when i think about the best 80s music i think about eh, i think about air supply no band before or after has so captured the balance of soulful yearning and i don't know unabashed sissiness as air supply stick to the script right Uh, but what would be better than the flawless original recordings well i'm glad you asked because K Hell Records presents an amazing collection. Fake Sean Connery Sings Air Supply. That's right, an amateurish imitation of Oscar winning woman slapper Sean Connery, butchering the already terrible hit songs of a truly insidious band. I mean it, just read what's in front of you. Okay, okay. Just take a listen. Got every woman in the world. To me, you're my fantasy, you're my reality. They're all here, all by my shell. Don't want to live all by my shell anymore. All the tracks you know and love, even the nights are better. Now that we're here together Even the nights are better since I found you Sometimes he speaks the lyrics, sometimes he actually puts in the effort to sing. You're once, twice, 
three times a lady dare. Wait, I'm pretty sure that was the Commodores. I'm all out of love. I'm so lost without you. I know you were right. Believing for so long. I'm all out of love. What am I without you? I can't be too late to say that I was so wrong. Oh, revolting. <clears throat> if the dulcet tones of fake Sean Connery can elevate an ordinary love song, what are you thinking of? Then imagine what he'll do to modern classics like this one. What are you thinking of? Okay, come on. Between 1978 and 1981, Air Supply topped the charts with hit after hit, and now Sir Fake Sean Connery fills really? 90 minutes with his recordings of every single one of them. And I don't know how you do it. Making love out of nothing at all. Out of nothing at all. Out of nothing at all. This great collection can be yours for the low price of twelve ninety nine. That's actually a pretty good deal, I Making suppose. Love. It's available Making on CD, love. cassette, and eight track. Tape? Love. Really? Eight Out track? Of nothing at all. You know you can't fool me. I've been loving you too long. It started so easy Something about a strong Look, I didn't want to be here Rich Outfield got a recording of me saying Well, stuff that could get me in trouble with the ASPCA And is sort of blackmailing me to do this I didn't even know rat fighting was illegal Much less betting on it in a church basement on Bunko But here I am Lost in love and I don't know much. Thinking aloud, I fell out of touch. Now I'm back on my feet, ready to be what you wanted. And look, I think Air Supply sucks. I think anybody who likes them should seriously consider getting a hearing aid. And I think Fred Rogers was a great man who doesn't deserve to be forgotten. Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood should still be on the air. And I don't mean this Daniel Tiger bullshit. Every kid in the world should know the man's name and be able to sing. That's it. I'm releasing the tape. Hope that 850 you made on Rats in the Cradle was worth it. No, no, wait. Uh, let me get to my point. I think Air Supply is a horrible band, and all their songs sound like something that was too wet and pathetic for Barry Manilow, but... But hey, they can only be better when voiced by Sean Connery. Pretty much everything you hate about them is balanced out by his weird, almost singing delivery. I can't live. It living is without you. I can't give. No, I can't give anymore. So, whether you love Air Supply like an iron lung, or you hate them like I do, you can't go wrong buying fake Sean Connery Sings the Hits. Just call the number on your screen and order a copy. Heck, order two copies. Apparently an actual operator is standing by. Was that good enough? Yeah, that was okay. Oh, Mandy, will you came and you gave without taking, and I sent you away, oh, Mandy. I think that one actually was Barry Mallow. Oh, oh, yeah. That's right. So I'd just like to say thanks for listening, everybody. And uh, we'll be back again with some other stories that are just waiting down the line we've got a bunch of them that are kind of ready to go and now that we'll have to do this over skype uh we'll probably be able to make them much quicker for you so tune in and check it out everybody okay
and donate to the Patreon for Mr. Rich Outfield if you love the Rich Outcast, which of course you do, because who doesn't? Uh, or donate to the show. There's still the donate button for now, and eventually there will be a Patreon button. We'll get to that. Right. I wanted to go to that uh, Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. Is that what it's really called? I keep Something thinking like that's that. right. Not because I want to see that, but because I'm hoping it is really bad. Uh huh. But we would need donations to be able to to go be able to, to afford to go to that show. So Plus, yeah, please. Donate. That would be so weird. We've never done that before, right? Gone separately and then done an episode, have we? No, I don't think so. Well, no, I think we have once or twice. Like you've gone and seen it, and then I saw it later, or I went and saw it with the kids, or something like oh, that. Oh, okay. I think there's been a time or two, but yeah, it will be a, an unusual occurrence for sure. So yeah, donate, folks. We'd love it, and we could provide you with more content. So thanks for listening, and uh, we'll be, we'll see you again next time. Hope so. Ciao, baby. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. Take two. What's your Ooh. favorite fake Sean Connery song? Lost in love and I don't know why. I don't know what my favorite Sean Connery song is. I love Air Supply. You knew that, right? Yeah, I knew that. It's all right. I love AHA. Wait, what? <laughs> I was chewing ice. I didn't hear what you said there. I said, it's all right. I love AHA. AHA is great, dude. AHA is the band that is... Un- Brazil, I think. Yeah, unexplainably huge in Brazil, just like Air Supply is unexplainably huge in Argentina. Well, not unexplainable. They're both great bands. Uh-huh. <laughs> you take that sound back, <laughs> sir. <laughs> Whoa, now that was a good, worthy addition to the burp reel. Maybe we should put that out someday as a whole podcast, just the burp reel. Just... For donators, for people who donate, yes. And remember, we started briefly a fart reel back when we had to hold our microphones and they were these little PlayStation 2 microphones that were from your daughter's karaoke game or something like that. Uh And you could just easily put them toward the planet Uranus. And uh, (laughs) yes, 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 we did do that. Deny it all you like and make it worse. And, uh, you know, why do you chew ice? Why must you chew ice? First of all, it cracks your teeth. You're ruining your teeth. And on top of it, it's noisy. And you do it in front of the mic while I try to speak. You are an evil man. You are a super villain. Oh, first I'm going to yawn. You want some ice to chew? Yes, please. Oh, boy, could I really just use some ice to chew? Especially since I've got that really cold, sensitive tooth right now. Mm. Who would love some ice?